Small business is about courage, risk-taking, independence, and we small business owners are survivors. Everybody has an idea for a business, but how do you take that idea from mind to market? This is the place to learn. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. It's a new kind of school. Together we'll learn about business from the inside out, from the people who've done it. We'll meet the men and women who are today's pioneers and quiet heroes. Their lives are the textbooks. Our classroom is the world. What's a clay pot maker with a degree in art doing in the aerospace business? Simple, she's growing her company. Grace Sujikawa Boyd founded Pyro Media in her basement in 1969. Today, in the commercial ceramic business, she is known by architects and interior designers as the creator of high-quality glazed pots. When her sales flattened in 1988 due to low-cost imports and construction slowdowns, she hired a consultant to find ways to keep her equipment utilized and her employees working. Now her growth is coming from industrial ceramics. My father had been in the uh, red clay flower pot manufacturing business for many years. And although I didn't inherit his business, uh, I knew I had knowledge of the pottery business. Did someone inherit it? Or? Oh, my brother did. Oh, wow. how'd how that happen? That's quite traditional in Japanese families. I started in the basement of my home just sort of as an art project right. while I was still employed. Mm -hmm. And people became interested, friends, relatives, started buying my experiments. And um, I mean, that got to be, you know, pretty exciting. Because so you thought, created well, something and someone actually gave you money for it. Yes. Went, well, this is good. Yes, this is good. But I was quite naive about, you know, actually making it happen, you right. know, having it be a business. So after being turned down by a dozen banks, mm -hmm. I... Uh, was talking to a friend whose brother was a um, accountant, and he said, "Well, why don't you go to the Small Business Administration?" Hey, yeah. I said, "Hey, what a good idea!" Never knew about him, yeah, probably. Right. right. So, when you got the money, you you had to quit your job immediately. Right, immediately. And um, did that scare you? No, I was I was so excited about getting the money and really getting into business, I mean, just the excitement of starting and getting into business. Mm -hmm. uh, you weren't scared? I wasn't scared. You I weren't thinking? It didn't even occur to me that I wasn't going to have a paycheck every other week. <laughs> and I love that. that. And oh, that, gee, no paycheck. <laughs> right. And that there were going to be lots of fried potato dinners. In order to survive, a person has to sidestep their initial goal a little bit and and I hadn't really lost sight of what I wanted to do but I had to you needed cash flow that's right absolutely <laughs> I mean you know I mean they were getting to... to be smaller and smaller portions of fried potatoes why do you think you didn't quit and just go do something else well I think that once I got into the excitement of doing business and creating something and selling it I got caught up in it and I just had this tunnel vision and there was no option. When did you decide you wanted to make big pots? There were a lot of comp competitors making small flower pots and I knew or I had hoped for a niche market, a high-end market, Fortune 500 companies who had a who lobby, these fancy yeah. places they wanted to decorate. Right, absolutely. So this will arrive in Tokyo all in one piece. Hopefully. Hey. What's the downside of being in the big pot business? Well, the downside is the percentage of loss you have. Mm -hmm. And in order to um, cover that percentage of loss, you have to demand a higher price. And so if, if I retail bought one of these large pots to put in my hotel lobby, what am I talking about? Dollar You're probably wise? talking about $1,500 for a a very large planner. Mm -hmm. Your mark. Yes. I would maker. shake hands, but I think your hand is full of clay. <laughs> so you can tell us exactly how to make a pot. Right. And but don't try this at home, right? No, I wouldn't try it in the kitchen, definitely. <laughs> I uh, try to deliver the clay into the mold. Uh, not too much, not too little. Mark is able to make at least 30 or 40 pots a day. You know when he needs okay. to. Once I get the bottom. 
template placed. I lower the template in. It has uh, settings here that are uh, calibrated so for the depth and a micro switch and uh, a stop to, for the vertical stop. And uh, then we have our horizontal stop with calibrations. And uh, then I have a speed control here which will start it revolving. I'm going to check for thickness right now. Is that like putting a toothpick in your brownies? <laughs> right. <laughs> See if, how just, it's doing? Exactly. This is just a depth indicator to make sure that all of our pots are equal thickness. When you started making pots, you didn't have this fancy machine. No. Um, we were poor, remember? <laughs> you were poor. <laughs> we were poor. You we had, had to make to it by hand. Improvise. Improvised, we made it by hand. We did slip casting, which is a less expensive process. We didn't have to have the kind of equipment that we have now to do these kinds but of things. But this pots. is worth the investment because Mark can make 30 a day with this. Yes. So Absolutely. it pays for itself. We had an efficiency expert come through here about 10 years ago and say he hadn't seen anything um, superior to it. And I can't help but think it's the absolute best myself. Our business had grown to the point where we were oh, eight, 10, 12 weeks back ordered. Great. And we thought, this is it. We are, we're going to expand. We're going to move to a bigger facility. And uh, that was when we made the decision to move to this 56,000 square foot warehouse, which is heaven compared to where we were. Mm -hmm. We had that warm and fuzzy feeling that, you know, we were in business and we were making money and we were going to finally get a halfway decent salary. And we were assuming at that point in time that business was going to continue to grow at the rate that it had been growing uh, the past you know, five years. After we had been in the building for a couple of years, rather than our, our revenues increasing by 30%, we were realizing a loss in sales. And of course, old panic sets in, and I immediately go to all of our sales territories where we're represented, and we say, what's going on? You know, uh, we're, you know, our sales is dropping off, and we have way better deliveries, we have more product, we have uh, greater capacity. And what I found out was that in the late 80s, uh, there were co uh, huge corporations who were importing and distributing terracotta planters, which made up our earthenware planters, which were unglazed, made up about 30% of our business. And so what I did was I thought, okay, I have this equipment, I have this building, I have a lot of people who know ceramics. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hire a consultant and I'm going to ask them to look for another business, a related business that we could go into that we could use, you know, all the existing equipment right. and this building and some of the personnel. And so um, the study took about six months. We had a marketing guy and we hired a uh, consultant from the University of Washington. He was a PhD in ceramic engineering. And at the end of our study, um, it was recommended that we look into high-tech ceramics. We uh, met up with uh, some engineers from Boeing who were interested in uh, doing some experimental high-temperature dyes um, using ceramics as opposed to using steel. So I started out by hiring my first engineer. Well, ceramic castable is a material that we use to make ceramic tools such as what you see here. This is uh, a tool to be made uh, uh, for a customer and they will use this contoured surface to form a metal part. So you all use a lot of the same technology to make these ceramic castables as, as Grace has used for 26 years in making pots. Precisely. After it's been fired and ground to a smooth surface, <clears throat> a piece of metal Titanium, in this case, is placed across the top. It's all clamped in a press. Everything is heated to 1,650 degrees Fahrenheit, approximately 200 PSI of argon gas. What does PSI stand for? Pounds per square inch. Thank you. Uh, is blown down on to the back side of the metal, and it forces the metal down into the contour. 
just like blowing bubble gum. All right, and so from this we get... From this? We get this. You get the metal part. We started from a, so, uh, a scratch with one engineer um, in 1989, and we've grown our staff to about seven or eight real capable people. This is what we call a solid modeler. Um, we can take data from big companies, aerospace companies, and design a ceramic die around their needs. Their specifications. They'll, they'll, yeah, they'll give us the shape that they want, and we'll produce a model and a die. The RS6000 is real powerful standalone machine. Which it's an expensive piece of hardware and software, um, but if you want to play with the big boys, you gotta, you, know, you gotta have it. So tell me, do you like working in a small business? I, I really enjoy it so far. Um, previously, having four and a half years in a big company, you get really specialized in one area, and then coming here, I can, I've been able to take that experience and use it for Pyromedia's benefit, as well as them giving me a lot of other diverse experiences down in the shop, on the floor, and there's always about four or five different tasks you're in charge of. Yeah, you get to unload heavy equipment. Uh, that's right, one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the benefits. <laughs> if you recognize your business falling off, then you have to immediately analyze what, you know, the reason behind the uh, loss of revenue or the loss of sales. Being able to recognize a problem is critical to small business because we don't have millions of dollars. We don't have money to waste. And we don't have money to waste. We don't have time to wait to see if business is going to get better in a month, three months, six months. I mean, you could be gone in, in a year. You could be gone in six months, depending on your overhead. Jim Shell, our veteran entrepreneur, agrees with Grace. When trouble comes, do something different. Well, first, I will guarantee you that you will get in trouble. We all do sooner or later. It's part of being in small business. What do you do? Well, first, let me tell you two things that you don't do. You don't do exactly what you're doing now. You've got to change, make a strategic change in something. Secondly, you don't throw more sales at your problem. It's, it's one of the things that we like to do because that's the way we are. We're sales oriented people, right? So we get in a little bit of trouble. Hey, I know, we'll get some more sales. That'll solve our problem. But what really happens is it makes it worse, accelerates the problem. What do you do? You've got to make some strategic changes, keyword strategic changes in the way you do things. Give you a couple of examples. In my case, strategic change would be at one point in time, our, I needed to upgrade our company from having a bookkeeper to a CFO. At another point in time, we needed to take a look at our customer base and get rid of one of our, one of our kinds of customers that we had started our business with. They were, they were doing small, small amounts of dollars. It was a sporting goods business and they were fun and, and it was kind of where, we were, where our heart was, but they didn't do our business any good anymore. We had to get rid of a major category of our customers. At another point in time, I had to hire a president to take my place because I wasn't doing the job that, that our company needed. So those are, those are strategic changes, 180, 180 degree changes in what you're doing. And that's what it requires. Nothing, working harder doesn't work. Okay, but you had to step back and analyze. You said your company, every company's gonna be in trouble. Your company was in trouble when you were unable to be president. You were not capable of being president of this large of a company. How did you determine that you were the problem? <laughs> Hattie, we've already talked about what's, what's the number one determinant of a, co a company's success or failure. It's, it's, it's the boss. The it's boss. the guy okay. that's running the place. All right, so you just decided the first thing to do is point a finger at myself. That's right. And you did that and replaced yourself with the president. But then this, this category of customers, how did you decide that that category of customers needed to go away? Ask my employees. It's amazing how many answers they have. They said, this group of customers is not bringing us enough profit. It's, it's, it, if you listen to your employees, they always know. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. If you want to learn more about starting, running, and growing a business, come to our website, smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video and interactive study guides. The only way we can compete with big business is to be faster, smarter, and better. We are the engine of the American economy. We create the jobs.
small business is about big commitment. It's about sacrifice and struggle. But we do it because we say, if I don't do this, my life won't be complete.